Well, welcome back to the second half of this uh, special 34th District State House Primary Candidate Forum. Uh, six of the eight candidates uh, have been here, as I always uh, like to say. Decisions are made by those who show up, so I thank you all for being here. And uh, of course, to our esteemed panel of uh, political pundits, we'll uh, get right back into the questions. And we start uh, the questioning with uh, Paul Rosicki from Mock Community College. And the first question, because we've been rotating who we start with, so uh, the same person does get stuck answering first or last all the time. Uh, Quincy Murphy will get the first question from Paul Rosicki. And just a little reminder, uh, panelists have 30 seconds to set up their question, and the candidates have 60 seconds for a response. All right, thank you. Uh, what is your view of the current emergency manager law? Uh, and in particular, whatever your view is, uh, what role should the state play when local governments get in financial trouble? I'm glad you was easy with me on the first question, but uh, <laughs> um, I don't agree with the emergency manager law. Um, before the emergency manager, um, the state takeover was declared for the city of Flint. They asked for a $20 million stabilization bond, was only given $8 million. So therefore, they was $12 million short of what they needed to cover the cost to stabilize the finances of the city of Flint. When the emergency manager came in, the um, finances went even deeper in debt. So I don't believe the emergency manager was brought here to fix the financial problems, but more of a political thing. Um, we um, rallied in Lansing when the um, emergency manager law was coming down to stop it from being um, happening. And um, I think the emergency manager is just a result of us not voting. We need to get out and go vote. And um, we have this emergency manager in the city of Flint by the result of the people not getting out and go vote. Vote in November. Same question goes to uh, Jeff Bean. Um, my current opinion on the emergency manager is it's a great way to make the governor's friends rich, it seems. Um, I look at places like, uh, from the, uh, or an educational standpoint, uh, Muskegon Heights as an abject failure, mm -hmm. and yet the people brought in still got their $6 million. Um, I think the way to, to fix that, uh, because you can't have dis or cities or school districts who go continually deeper in debt. I get that. So the financial coaching, I think, is the smarter way to go about that, that you work with the elected officials. Um, we have good city council people. We have a good mayor. Um, the, if they needed assistance in how to get out of that from a financial standpoint and you've got a better idea, great. Come in and work with us, but don't come in in opposition to us and take away the democratic process. Same question, 60 seconds, Donna Calvin. My, con my concern was why w was the emergency manager called in? Um, balancing a budget, a uh, person that knows accounting knows how to balance a budget. Uh, I guess I ask, the way that an emergency manager is called in, ch changing how that is, maybe maybe with uh, the city has to have a, five to a majority vote to say that they wanted to come in, I, I don't know how that was actually done uh, and who called them in. I didn't, I personally didn't see a need. Um, the thing was the general fund, you putting all the money into that and then you get to decide wherever it goes to. If it doesn't go to the right place, then that doesn't get paid. So cha changing how an emergency manager comes comes into the, into the city, uh, I would look at that from a le legislative standpoint on trying to change the jargon on how, how you can uh, an emergency manager actually comes in and takes over the city. Thank you. David Davenport, same question. <laughs> I don't like it, but I understand why it's there. You all pay taxes. You all don't vote for the same people. You got people that would vote for Ned DeWino just to get favors from him, put him in office over millions of dollars, and he knows nothing about it. So guess what? The whole city goes down because of the majority voted just to get favors. I understand why he's, why he's there. We have allowed that. What I want to do state legislation is go up and put some parameters in place that you cannot get on the ballot unless you have taken the financial classes to be able to be over millions of dollars. This is what we need. This is what I mean by times changing and laws not changing. Back in the days, we could do that. Everybody, everybody was comfortable. Everybody knew everybody. Everything was okay. But now it's, a, it's finance. Everybody wants money in their pocket, and they don't care how they get it. If they get it off your backs, they get it off your backs. 
but most of these elected officials have not given back those salaries to the constituents to say, hey, I'm going to help you because you helped me get elected. And that's what I want to do when I get there. Thank you. Nathan Morris, same question. I have a problem with, with the whole takeover in the manner in which it was done. Um, when I heard emergency financial manager, I envisioned a person who was coming in to assist our elected officials with the management of our finances. I didn't envision that we were going to have a dictator takeover uh, that would abolish our city charter, that would abolish our labor contracts, that has no uh, concern about the, the residents' voices. He's silencing our, our administration, and to me, that just stripped democracy from everybody in this room. And so I do have a real problem with it. I do agree that parameters need to be set up where this person can come in, if needed, and assist our elected officials and let us as residents hold our elected officials accountable for their errors. Thank you. Sheldon Neely. You know, uh, as a city council person, I was the only council person that's currently a council person now that voted against this emergency manager coming into the city of Flint. But in this current form, the emergency manager law is the most oppressive and anti-American law on the books in the state of Michigan. Um, the role of, of state government is to assist, not to control. Uh, as villages, townships, uh, cities, and municipalities alike, you know, we deserve to be assisted, but not controlled in the way that this emergency manager has come in. And though it may be uh, very uncomfortable to talk about this whole experience, we, we have to really talk about the truth in this. You know, the urban centers throughout the core of Michigan are the ones that's being oppressed by this emergency manager laws. The ones who have a high population of poor people and minorities are being controlled. And this experiment has been going on for more than three years now, and they cannot point to anywhere in the state of Michigan where this law has been effective helping. Our community right now, under three years of emergency management, is worse off than it was when we started. All right, the next question will come from Susan Demas, and uh, the, uh, the first responder <laughs> will be Jeff Bean. The Detroit Free Press recently did a series on charter schools and their authorizers in Michigan and found sweetheart land deals and powerless school boards in dozens of schools across the state. Do Michigan's laws need changing as far as charter schools go? And what would you propose if elected to the legislature? Thank you for asking this question. <laughs> as a public school teacher, um, I have a lot of problems with the charter school laws. It's written, and especially as it's enforced, um, that there is very little, little requirement placed on the charter districts. Um, there's very little accountability for it. Um, I stated earlier the Muskegon Heights mistake is probably the most blatant example of it. Um, but there's no accountability to it, and that's what needs to be rewritten. If we're going to need, if we're going to, we feel that there's really a need for charters, then you have to hold them accountable. I think what's more responsible is to bring people back to public schools. Public schools to me are the last bastion of democracy. If you don't like how your school system works, get to a school board meeting, get to the buildings, um, make those changes because you're engaged in your child's education. That's where I think the real reform will come from. Donna Calvin, same question. I thought about um, charter schools and, I, and my question was why are all of the parents taking their kids out of school and putting them in other schools? There has to be a problem with the school system um, that their children were in. When they did the, uh, back in June when they had the uh, conference, uh, the workshop uh, for schools, they had 20 buses that were scheduled to go and pick parents up and they were gonna give them food. There were probably about five parents that came. The people that are looking at keeping the school system are not the parents. The parents are not there. The, the, the kids, um, the, the, the parents are not a part of their children's life to the point of getting them to stay inside of the public schools. There's got, there's got to be a reason for that. There's got to be a reason, and once you find that reason, um, there, we, can, we can look back to our public schools. I don't, I don't see a need for charters to grow. 
David Davenport, same question. I just talked about it at my opening statement. Public schools have an issue. Bottom line is the times have changed and the laws have not. I've, back, I've been back there. I got a two-inch thick book of things that need to be changed in the system. I am a father of a child that is in a charter school, and that's because I would throw this title so far away before I mess up my child's education. When I see that you got unqualified people in positions just because they're friends and family inside of a public school system, I will not subject my child to that mess. And this is what's going to change. Charter schools just started. Yeah, they're going to they got quirks, they got problems just like community schools do. Public schools do. But until you are where I am and able to see what I see, Mr. Bean, you cannot go up and change anything. Bottom line. Thank you. All right, Nathan Morris. I have a very negative view on charter schools um, as taxpayers. I think that our tax dollars are needed for public school funding, um, and, and our tax dollars are going into these charter schools because of laws that, that have been enacted. Um, so I do not agree with, with our tax dollars, my tax dollars, your tax dollars being sent to charter schools, online schools. There's no accountability, as Mr. Bean said. Who is, who is holding our charter schools accountable for anything? It's just like the privatization of any service in the state of Michigan. Who is accountable? And if we as taxpayers cannot hold somebody accountable, then in my opinion, the plan is wrong. Sheldon Neely. Yeah, as a product of uh, community schools and public education, uh, and I hope that's not an indictment on the system, but more of a compliment. <laughs> but, but the thing of it is I'm a proponent of uh, the public school system. I was a high school counselor for about 10 years uh, in Flint Public Schools. And the real problem is, is, is the amount of funding that, that goes into our public school system especially a poor district, like, uh, we need to make sure, and as a state uh, representative, I would go up and make sure that we return dollars back to uh, our community schools, because right now they give us just enough money to undereducate our children. Uh, the, the Flint schools in, in particular, is some of the best trained teachers are, are there in, that, in those school systems educating the kids. And as it relates to charter schools, you know, and it's about marketing. It's, it's about marketing to uh, those families, letting them know that a public school experience does not have to be a negative one, and we need to return those dollars back to the public school systems. And that's what I would plan to do as a state representative. Okay, Quincy Murphy. Charter school laws should reflect um, private businesses, private schools, um, public dollars should go towards public schools. Um, and I'm going to give you an example. If Hurley Hospital is a public hospital and public dollars go towards um, Hurley Hospital and um, they see all patients, I think um, that should be the same with public schools. If charter schools want to be, get established in the um, community, then they need to find their own dollars. I served on the facilities committee for the Flint School District back in 2009, and we did a um, year study um, with funding from the Roofmont Foundation to make recommendations to the school board on what should happen to our Flint Public School District. So I am a, a great support of public schools. Um, I'm not against charter schools, but I'm against public dollars used to um, fund charter schools. Thank you. George Moss, you have uh, the next question, and it goes first to Donna Calvin. Okay, I want to first of all thank the uh, panel again for showing up, and you're doing a very good job, all of you. Uh, when we interviewed the county commissioners before we had this panel, we were, I was concerned about the 83 counties that we have in the state of Michigan, and each one of them is individually trying to address problems on the state level, diluting their power. You are running for the state level, and my concern is that we have a federal government out of control. Um, on the state level, I've been advocating um, the convening of the Constitution Convention. Uh, because I think we have to rein the federal government back underneath the Constitution. And we have these states here that were supposed to be powerful. Is there, is there a question I will finish in here, yeah, George? Yeah, uh, yeah, I will ask the question. Uh, but it's not, we're not yet operating under what was intended. The states will be a lot more powerful than they are. And my question would be, would you be in favor of the 
the circulation of the petition going around the, the, the country to have the states to, in fact, convene a convention to bring the federal government back under the control that was intended by the founders. Dana Calvin. I, I would have to say yes, yes to that. Um, our, our con to come back under what the Constitution, the Constitution says that we could, yeah. Um, that that's a big wow. <laughs> if that was a, if that was opposed to me, I I would say yeah. Donna, it's not unusual for George to take longer to ask the question than it takes the candidates to respond. Wow. <laughs> Maybe rephrase it in a way that... Uh... Now, let's go to uh, David Davenport. And I'm going to ask you that question. Could you shorten it up for me? I sure can. Um, the I'm, I was saying the House was supposed to be the people's body. The, the Senate was the state's body. The state legislatures elected the, the senators, the representatives on the national level. That was changed in 1913. Uh, we, the federal government has gotten out of control, and it's because the states don't have a voice. And I think individually, each state speaking individually cannot speak to Washington. That wasn't the intention in the first place. They're going to have the state's representative in, in, the, in, the, in the capital. My, my question was, do you favor what's going around right now where people are advocating for a convention to be convened by the states, it takes 34 states, to convene a convention so as to correct the problem that occurred when it took the state, the senators out of the, by the way the senators are elected, took them out of how they're elected, and uh, they're now elected by popular vote. They were elected by the state legislatures, and that was changed and the states lost their voice. And what I'm asking is, do you favor a convention that would in fact write that and put that back where it was, it was intended by the founders? Yes, to a certain extent. The, the certain extent I do believe is that federal government should be over education. Teachers should be federally employed. Um, all employees should have background checks over children. I, I, I would support that, but only if that parameter was in there to where the government would take over education because you got so many crooks that think about money when they get up over these children, they can't fend for themselves, and this is what happens. You wind up in deficits because of things that's going behind it. So yes, I would support that to get it right back where it is, but I would also ask that the federal government take over education because I don't believe after you graduate out of high school, you're grown and you're on your own. I believe they should at least help you get an associate's degree. You shouldn't have to pay it. You shouldn't have to pay, just like high school. You don't have to pay. Get them out there where they can be, become stable and do something with themselves. So I think that we should pay for that. And yes, I would support it. Nathan Morris? I'm going to have you repeat the whole thing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Did I mention that George was a writer lecturer at the uh, we, University of Michigan? Five sound bite. <laughs> I, I, I do not support this petition that's going around. Um, I, I think that, you know, and I thought that Michigan had signed, and I thought Michigan was that 34th state that had already signed, and then boom, but I read that on Facebook, so it might so not you have been true. So you know it's true, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, no, I don't support it. I think that, that we as the American people need to grow up. We need to start working across party lines. Get rid of some of these party lines that we have drawn in the sand. Democrats, Republicans, Tea Party, Independents. We need to draw the line and we are representing the American people and the American people deserve better than what they're getting out of the government right now. So I would not support that. Same question, Sheldon Neely. Yeah. And, I, and I heard two questions, and I'm going to answer, try to answer both of them. One about a petition and, uh, for a referendum to be placed on the ballot, and one about uh, states coming together. Um, as a state legislator, I, I would not support a petition, but I would not be opposed to the, a voters uh, galvanizing their strength to go forth. That's a democracy. Uh, one of the things I would not start as a state representative, I would not have a declaration of war against our federal government, but I would have a declaration of war against high insurance rates in our community, a declaration of war against poverty in our community, a declaration of war against taxation of seniors' pensions. 
Uh, and I think my, my attention should be more focused as a state representative to those issues that's more germane to the quality of life, especially in the jurisdiction in which I would represent, rather than having a war against the federal government. And so I would have uh, those types of battles in front of me uh, as a state representative. Quincy, same question. Being that it was um, a very kind of technical question for me um, as a representative, if you came to me with it, um, I will have to do a little bit more research and get back with you on that, so I won't answer yes or no to you, but I am in agreement of having dialogue to um, discuss the issues of concerns dealing with the um, con 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 putting together a convention to um, talk about this issue. But I don't want to say yes and be wrong, and I don't want to say no and be wrong. So my thing is to do a little bit more research, because it's better to say nothing than to just say something, because you want me to um, say yes or no to your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And Jeff Bean, same question. At great risk, I'm going to ask George. <laughs> <laughs> Were you speaking of the federal constitution or the state constitution? Yeah, I am talking about the federal constitution. OK. Um, I'm never against a petition. Um, that's the beauty of democracy. If people want to get out and put something on a ballot, I think that's essential, and I would support that. However, I'm not particularly in favor of rewriting the federal constitution at this time. I think uh, the constitution as a document is pretty solid. Uh, the practitioners currently seem to have gone off that track. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to be more interested in other things than what the laws say. Um, so in that sense, I'm not necessarily in favor in convening to rewrite the Constitution. I would be in favor of convening um, and getting some sanity back in the federal government uh, when people are trying to sue the president for executive orders, um, which is part of his job. That seems to me they're pretty clear they don't get what is there. So um, in that sense, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty safe with where the Constitution's at. Right? I, I get the sense that uh, Paul Rosicki would really like to weigh in on this. <laughs> <laughs> we did a whole show on and, that. And, yeah, and, and, I, and I feel tempted to let him, in as much as George got to ask his question twice. <laughs> but but uh, actually, in order to uh, keep things uh, moving along, and uh, we are on a little bit of a uh, time crunch, um, we're going to do what we did last hour. There is uh, one remaining question. That will come from our uh, special uh, media guest, uh, Susan Demas. And the answers begin with, I lost my place, David Davenport. The Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act protects Michigan residents from discrimination on the basis of race, gender, national origin, height, weight, and religion. Do you support gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people being added to the law? I'll say it and I'll say it again. They pay taxes. They deserve the same rights as everyone else. Just as long as it's not imposed on me, I have no problem with it. Um, they're human beings. Why not treat them like human beings? But you got so many people that wants to throw the Bible at the situation and say, well, God's not happy with it. Well, that's for them and God to deal with, not me. But would I? I? I have no problem with supporting it, as long as it's not imposed on me. So no problem at all. Nathan Morris, same question. I'll say it again. I'm 100% <laughs> behind this. I am an openly gay candidate here and very proud of it. I've been in a relationship for 14 years. And is marriage equality part of my agenda, no, because I think it's going to happen without me preaching and, and pushing for it. Uh, the, the legal system is going to play out in this. Uh, I do 100% support adding uh, sexual orientation uh, to the law. Um, honestly, you know, they're, they're, the statistics are one in six people are gay. Well, probably not, but we're not bothering anyone, we're not any different than anyone in this room. I have my family, you have yours. Okay, Sheldon Neely, same question. <clears throat> Bigotry is, is no good to any community anywhere. And when we, and this is a form of bullying, when we have uh, open uh, bigotry, 
in any form. And as a state representative, you know, we have to represent our full constituency. Uh, and, and anyone that would preach uh, bigotry does not believe in love and getting along with one another, bridging the gaps uh, amongst you know, our neighbors and our friends and our family. But uh, bigotry in any form is, is no good. And I would support adding those laws to protect individuals and their individual rights uh, to be a citizen in full in a community, uh, not a citizen in part. As an African-American man, uh, it was a law a long time ago, before the 14th Amendment, uh, that, that deemed African-Americans not full citizens. And I wouldn't want any law to be upheld that it would uh, punish anybody in punitive fashion to say they weren't full citizens. Quincy Murphy, same question. Um, I, I'm sitting here looking at my literature, and it says, as your state representative, Quincy Murphy pledged to, number one, support amending state civil rights to include sexual orientation and gender identity. So that's my number one, so it's enough said on that. <laughs> situation fair, there. Um, fair enough. Thank you. I, I think George could learn something from your <laughs> brevity. Um, That's right. <laughs> Jeff That's Bean, right. Same, uh, same question. It bothers me that we're still discussing this at this point in our history. Um, as long as there's ignorance, however, we're going to need things like the Larson Act. Absolutely, I support that. Um, I've been fighting for civil rights my whole life. Um, I picketed for the United Farm Workers Union. I have written uh, essays and documents um, around uh, the, the rights of women. Um, I have fought for the rights of gay students in my classroom. Um, and so, yeah, this is just absolutely a no-brainer for me. Yeah. Donna, same question. Yeah, it is a no-brainer, civil rights. I think we should get out of people's bedrooms. Um, I watch a, a television show, I forget the name of it, but it shows a family. We have, we have very blended families in America now, very blended. So to, to not, uh, to, to say no against that would be against, would be against families. Um, I would, I would support, I would support it, um, being put as a, as a civil right of, a, of an American, yes. All right, thank you. And with that, uh, it's uh, actually time to start the uh, closing statements from the candidates. And um, I uh, actually it would have fallen to David uh, Davenport anyway, but during the break, he asked me if he could go first. And, and the only reason I bring it up is uh, he's going to be leaving, and his leaving early before everyone else finishes their comments is not an editorial statement, but an effort to get to a school board meeting at 6 o'clock. So we'll start. You have 90 seconds, uh, and, and then we'll go on to Nathan after uh, David Davenport, your closing remarks. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank everybody for having me. Um, I came here today to say what I've been saying for years. Things need to change. And if you keep voting for the same people, you won't get the change that you deserve. I've been on the board for five and a half years, true enough, and really nothing's gotten done because of my uh, uh, um, consistency to do what's right in my heart by God. Um, I have not yet had a chance to be a person that's able to do something without people looking over my shoulder or putting me down. I think this seat is what is deserved in my favor right now because I definitely have a lot of education issues that need to be taken care of. Anybody sitting in this audience can, cannot say that they haven't made it where they are because of education. And if you keep letting these laws and education fall, these children will never get educated. It's up to you all. It's up to you all. They can't vote. They need you all to step up and say, we're tired of this. And as long as you keep putting people in the seats that can smooth talk you and give you a favor in your hand, our children are going to suffer. But just remember, Dr. King didn't do that. That's why you're here today. You didn't suffer. So why allow these children to keep suffering? Education is the key, people. And if you choose not to adhere to my voice today, God bless you, and I still love you as brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you. All right. And David, uh, good luck squeezing out of here. <laughs> and please be careful. We don't want this to end up being... Uh, you know, going viral on YouTube. Um, I would get blamed for putting it up. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although somebody would say that, you know, Sheldon was the second pusher, <laughs> right. and uh, it'd be a big conspiracy and uh, last forever. Uh, but the next uh, closing statement goes to Nathan Moore. Again, thank you, everybody, for having us here, Tom, and Good Beans Cafe. I've, I've enjoyed uh, listening and, and answering questions for the panel. Um, again, I, I'm running as a concerned citizen for this for this district. I'm not running as a career politician. I have no interest in a new job. I, I, I like my job. I like what I do. But we need change. We need to change the current path that the city of Flint is on, that the 34th district is on, and that's got to start with crime. And no one up here has made that their number one priority. Crime is imperative that we need to get a hold of it, or we're going to keep in this downward spiral that we're in, and and our current officials are, are not really addressing it. Our emergency financial manager finds that we can lay off 32 more police officers, which is not acceptable in my eyes as a concerned resident. Um, I'm hoping, you know, I look at this race as potentially whoever gets voted in is going to be our state rep for the next six years, six years potentially. And I, I am asking you for two years. Give me two years. If I if I am successful in doing my job and representing you, the people of Flint, then we'll talk re-election. But right now I'm asking for two years. Sheldon Neely. Yeah. I do want to thank you, Tom, and thank you all for being here and, and those is viewing this, uh, for having this forum, because it is important for us to put ourselves up for the consumption of the public to ask for consideration for their vote. And I want to thank the people that showed up as candidates. And for those that didn't, that tells you uh, where their mind is right now. But, you know, as a candidate for this race, as a, as, a, as, a, as a man of God and a husband and a father and a son and my wife and my, my mother is out in the audience now, I know it's important to the residents inside the city of Flint. I'm not a career politician, I'm an engineer by profession. Uh, as we move forward, we're facing some very, very difficult times in our community, especially in this transition from manufacturing to education mindsets in our, in our community. I've been doing a great job as a city council person. I have a proven record of success, and I will continue that record as a state legislator for you. I will produce laws that will enhance the quality of life for residents. And I talk about residential, recreation, economics, education, and safety are the five points that we would attack uh, in this community. As a candidate for this office and putting myself up for public consumption, I would ask everybody to be very mindful of, of how politics has, has been done in the past. And, and I run a pro-Neely campaign and not an anti-anybody else campaign. Uh, and so I want you guys to vote for the individuals that has a proven track record of success and not who is endorsing them if they're being endorsed by any particular uh, entity. Uh, don't weigh that. The only endorsement that's important is the in, uh, independent voter endorsement. Thank you. Thank you. Quincy Murphy, 90 um, seconds. I would like to just thank y'all for inviting me here today. And um, I'm glad to see this beautiful panel here um, discussing issues. Um, well, I am running for office because I want to work for you. I want to come in your neighborhoods and help organize on a grassroots level. I want to take your concerns to Lansing. I want our, us to be effective in the community. Um, I was just thinking, why did I decide to run for state rep? And I said, wouldn't it be a lovely day in the neighborhood if we saw the state representative, the Congress, the county commissioner, the city council, the mayor, working together, sitting down at a table, figuring out solutions to the problem to solve, Flint's problems. I have not seen that in since I've been following politics for the last 20 years. I have not actually saw a meeting convened where all the elected officials coming together. We missing that. They going in their own directions. And my vision for the city of Flint is not necessarily the vision of the um, existing elected officials or some of the candidates, and I respect their position to run for office, but I just don't see our vision as the same as to what it would take to change the city of Flint. And I'm asking that you give me a chance on August 5th, not only give me a chance, pray for me, because this is not easy to go against good people like this. Thank you. 
Jeff Bean, 90 seconds for a closing statement. Um, I also want to thank everybody for being here, and especially Tom, we're going to miss your voice in this community. Um, you've heard answers today that may or may not have answered, the, or questions um, that may or may not have been answered. Um, I would repeat that I've been a teacher here in Flint for 22 years. Um, I have proven my research skills with a degree from Harvard University. I have proven my negotiation skills with a historic contract between the United Teachers of Flint and the Flint School District. Um, I have proven my support of workers' rights by speaking with Reverend Jesse Jackson and James Hoffa Jr. at the rally against the right to work for free legislation that Governor Snyder snuck through last year. Um, I would encourage you to, to look at me as somebody who is a new voice, a new technique that can indeed still operate within the confines or the context of Lansing. Um, I would quote, as I have frequently, um, Medgar Evers, who is a great hero of mine, um, a leader of the NAACP in Mississippi, who said, I don't know, he didn't say it exactly like this, I've adjusted it, I don't know if I'm going through heaven or hell, but I'm going through Flint. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, Donna Calvin, you have 90 seconds for a closing statement. Um, my motto was a fresh voice for the people, and I want to be that state official to help to fix the problems that the city has. Um, we'd have to go out and ask you what are your concerns. In asking people what their concerns were, they were concerned about the emergency manager coming in. Emergency manager is the reason why our water rates are high that, like they are now. It wasn't because people weren't paying their water bills. It was because they came in and they did. And uh, that was one of the things that the emergency manager put into play. The, what I see is the way to change things in Michigan right now is by the popular vote. You have to organize people together to come against whatever they're coming against with a popular vote. Um, and it, because I have had, uh, I do have experience in, in, in bringing people together with the popular vote, uh, I feel that I would be the best, the best representative that you could send to Lansing. In thinking about this, I went out to, and I'm going to put this out here, to the cannabis uh, cup out in Clio. There are representatives who are looking at trying to eventually possibly have uh, hemp uh, marijuana legalized uh, in Michigan. Just like in, other, in the state of Colorado, how they're making all the money, um, taxes, uh, money from that. That could be something that we, could, that we can all talk about to look into uh, for our city. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank you all. But first, I wanted to note that, it, that one of the interesting things about today's forum is that the women seem to be getting the last word. Um, <laughs> in any event, uh, I, I, I've always said that uh, decisions get made by people who show up, so I want to thank you all for being willing to come out and talk to people, let people get to know you a little bit. Quincy Murphy and uh, Sheldon Neely, Nathan Morish, um, and uh, David Davenport, who had to leave early, Donna Calvin, Jeff Bean, thank you all for being part of this. And of course, couldn't do it without our... Uh, our premier political pundits. I want to thank our special guest who uh, came over, I think, from Lansing, Mason, Lansing, uh, Susan Demas from Inside Michigan Politics. And of course, our regular pundits, uh, uh, Paul Rosicki and, uh, and, and, and the very quiet and demure George Moss. Uh, um, I, want to, I want to thank you both for being a part of this whole series of, throughout July. August 5th is the, uh, is the primary, and has, as has been pointed out, very often the uh, uh, primary elections in Genesee County, uh, and because of the way districts are drawn, I think in many counties in Michigan now, um, a lot of uh, campaigns are decided in the primary, and a lot of people don't participate. Hopefully by your participation in forums like these, we can get more people encouraged to participate in the primary process. It isn't exactly as if we have all that great a turnout even in November. So uh, hopefully they will encourage that. I want to say thank you uh, to yet another woman who was involved in the, por in the uh, forum, our timekeeper, Andrea Sutton. Thank you for uh, keeping everybody on track especially George, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I also want to thank all of the people who came out in the audience, uh, 
This will be available online soon, and uh, I, I believe this uh, particular episode is going to air tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, Comcast Channel 17. Um, and I want to give a uh, special thanks to our regular sound man uh, way in the back, Captain Jack from RLX Sound, the sounds you want. Um, also, uh, a big help in getting things set up was uh, Kevin Van Wagner from here at Good Beans Cafe, and he's always uh, willing to help out for events like these. And I want to say, uh, I want to give a shout out to 3MG, um, that's uh, Mid Michigan Media Group, who are doing the, uh, the video presentation and FlintTalkRadio.com as well for uh, uh, putting some of the webcasting together. Uh, once again, I'm Tom Sumner. Thank you all for being here. And uh, I've been saying we'll see you next time, but uh, I guess this time I'll say this is it.